Hey guys, it is time for another Spotlight On, and this month we are going to be talking about the TV show, Leverage. Now, I know, it's a TV show. It's not related to books. However, I did want to talk about this particular TV show because I think that if you enjoy a good story, this TV show will have something for you. And there are two things in particular that I wanted to talk about today. And those are the first one being the writers had a real commitment to canon that made the internal logic flow very, very well. It was so amazingly consistent that it's, it's actually worth noting. It's worth me talking about. That's how consistent it is and how committed to canon they are. And then number two, the fact that a lot of things, but specifically the characters could have easily fallen into stereotypes or, um, you know, tired tropes and they didn't, they were actually turned a little bit on their side. And I really, really appreciated all of that. So let's talk about what Leverage actually is. It obviously is a TV show. It ran for five seasons. Um, they were short seasons, so each um, each season has between 12 and 16 episodes. They were um, they're all 42 minutes long without commercials, and it is about five criminals who team up together to um, get exact revenge on a guy who tries to con them. And as they are doing this, they realize that they make an amazing team, that the team is actually better than the sum of its parts. And so they decide to continue working together and go after, um, actually people who are really like, manipulate the system so that they get everything that they want and the little guy it gets nothing um each of the main characters is in fact an expert in their field and so it is really interesting to watch these people who are amazing at what they do con honestly often they're the white male ceos of terrible companies very cathartic to watch and um, as they're doing it, they grow as people, they grow as a team, and it is, it's really interesting to watch. So let's talk a little bit about that commitment to canon that the writers had. So one of the things that is, it, it just becomes apparent really quickly is that these characters are set up, the world was set up, and it feels like anybody who writes on the show was required to watch it so that they really understood what was going on. And they, I don't feel like there was ever a point in time where I thought, but that doesn't make sense or that's out of character because anytime it didn't make sense or there was something where the character was acting not like themselves, it was either previously explained or immediately after explained why they were doing that. And I think that's really important, but also just like, for example, how they actually wrote all these cons out, it's, they clearly took this idea of, okay, well, if these are the people who are the best at what they individually each do, then what does that mean? Well, it means that they are not ever going to make a rookie mistake, right? Because they're the best at what they do. Rookie mistakes are like, in their past, it wouldn't happen. So every episode, the con absolutely threatens to go off the rails, but it's always because the mark did something that they didn't expect or, you know, something outside of their control happened or they changed, something happened where they ended up changing the objective of their con. So something else always happens. It's never, ever a rookie mistake which is consistent because they are the best at what they do. Whereas I feel like I have watched other shows where it's like, they're the best at what they do, but they're going to make this silly mistake in the very first episode. And you're like, okay, but are they really the best at what they do? <laughs> Seriously? Um, and so they do, they think about, okay, if they're the best, then what does that mean? If, you know, 
for example, this character of Nate, if he is, um, got this trauma in his past, what does that mean that he's likely to do? If, 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 and they always kind of make it consistent for what they have already put into place. So I really appreciate that. But it also means that even things that are just feel like, you know, throwaway lines end up can end up becoming very important. So in, I think it's the second episode of the season. So the one right after the pilot, second episode, first season, Parker and one of the characters, Parker ends up with a plant and she says, I have a plant. What does it do? <laughs> and like, it's kind of a throwaway line in that we're even like the camera is kind of panning out and all this kind of stuff. It really was meant as a throwaway line, but even that throwaway line gives us insight into Parker as a person, which I think is a really amazing way to write things. But also it's a line that comes back in the third or fourth season. Parker is given a plant by one of the other characters and it's a Venus flytrap. And it shows us two things. First, that the character who gave the plant really understands Parker as a person. <laughs> and second of all, that it, it allows her to say that line of, it's a plant and it does something. And it's like, yes, yes, this, you took this throwaway line and you made it part of this world. And so when it came time for plants, of course, she's going to get a plant that does something. And of course, that's going to make her happy because we've already established that she thinks that plants should do something. <laughs> and they do this with like everything on the show. It is just fantastic. It is, it feels like nothing is extraneous because it all seems to come back at some point and remains consistent through the world. So I, I, I think that especially in TV shows, but in media in general, we just don't quite get enough of that where it feels like the world is so fully fleshed out that even throwaway lines can become important. We just don't get that often enough in, in anything. And so I do think it is worth pointing out and talking about when I do find it, which obviously I found it in Leverage. The other thing that I wanted to talk about is the characters themselves and how they all could have very easily fallen into these stereotypes, but they didn't. They were actually written and to be much more interesting than they could have turned out. So let's talk about all those characters and let's start at the top with Nate. Nate is the mastermind. He is the one that knows what everybody can do and keeps just a ton of details in his hand, head and forms the plan and gets the crew through the con. And he is a functional alcoholic, sometimes more functional, sometimes more alcoholic, but he is an alcoholic and the, th and, and he, he's an alcoholic because of some very real grief and pain from his past. The kind of thing where like you understand why he is, he is the way he is. And even such, you're still just kind of like, okay, but you're handling things badly. This is not the way. And I think that how, and the audience is okay having that kind of reaction because the other characters have that reaction to him as well, where they're like, we totally understand why this is so painful for you, but it doesn't make it okay. We understand why you're going to alcohol to numb the pain, but it doesn't make it okay. And his alcoholism is never portrayed in a positive light. It's always neutral to negative in that his the rest of the team has accepted that this is who he is. However, as soon as it is interfering with his ability to run a con, as soon as it's interfering with anything, they are on him about it. And I think that that's a really interesting way to portray it and not one that we usually get to see. We don't get to often challenge this notion that it's, it's not okay. Like if you have a hard day, six or seven nights out of the week, then maybe something needs to change that there can be functional alcoholics in the world and it doesn't make them pleasant people to be around. Like it, it brings up a lot of interesting things and it could have very easily gone into this whole, he's got man pain and the, the whole show is about 
him and his pain and how he has to numb it with alcohol. And it just really, it, it comes to the forefront on occasion, but it's often very much just in the background as a character trait. And then we have Sophie. Sophie is um, probably in her early to mid 40s and she is the group's femme fatale. She is the bombshell. She is the one that is, you know, dressed to the nines and when she is conning, she is using that sex appeal to her advantage and she that's how she cons people. And I love the idea that the person that is using sex to get, you know, that sex appeal to get what she wants is somebody who's probably in her 40s. That is so amazing, especially considering that there is a younger female in this group. The fact that we are allowing a 40 plus year old woman to be just sexy is awesome, especially considering it's Hollywood, right? I just, I just love this idea of an older woman bombshell and the fact that you believe it. Gina Bellman is the actress and she's amazing and you believe that she is able to do that. And so I love that. And I also love that as the bombshell character, she's not super, I mean, she's self-absorbed, but she also genuinely cares about the other, her teammates. She loves the, the younger crew members, the three that I haven't gotten to, she very clearly runs interference between them and Nate. Like she is not just selfish. She's a little self-absorbed, but she's not really selfish. And I really, really appreciate that because again, we could have had a younger person who is the bombshell. We could have had, you know, the super self-absorbed, selfish bombshell. And it was just, we got neither of those things and it's beautiful. And then we come to Elliot and Elliot, I think is, um, he, I think he's supposed to be in his late thirties, mid to late thirties, but he is our hitter. So he is the brawn of the operation and he is played by Christian Kane. And I believe that Christian Kane is only like five foot 10. And so you would kind of expect the person who's the brawn to be tall and just built and like, all of these things. Now, Christian Kane is not a tiny man. He is sturdy. He is very clearly strong, but he's not a huge dude. And for his character, Elliot, how he describes his job is he takes all the punches and he just gets up more often than the opponent that he is facing. And I love that description. And I love the fact that that's how he describes himself because that's honestly gives you a lot of insight into his character as well and how he sees his job. But usually when you get somebody who is clearly the brawn, they don't have the brains, but Elliot does. And we are given a clue to that very early on. Again, second episode, he is IDing a gun from a recording and all he has is the sound of it firing and he knows what kind of gun it is. And you cannot do that if you, are not intelligent, right? But not only that is he's, he's the muscles, but he's also very well rounded. He's obviously an athlete of sorts, but he, he also gardens, he cooks, he is a musician. He's intelligent. He's much, much more than just his muscles. But I think the thing that really becomes very interesting, and again, could have easily fallen into stereotype is he was, he's a hitter. So he used to kill people when he was with an old crew. We are given that information pretty early on. He has actually killed people. He doesn't anymore, but he has. And he does not see himself as redeemable. He is, he's going to hell and he knows it kind of thing. And usually when we see that kind of story, what ends up happening is we get a character who thinks that they're not redeemable. And then somebody comes along that basically says, you have been absolved of your sins. You can go forth with a lighter heart, right? And they're redeemed. And in this, in, in this case, we don't get that because Elliot says, it does not matter what you say. 
I cannot be redeemed. I, redeemed. It doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't, I am going to hell regardless because of my past actions. So it doesn't matter. I'm okay with that and I have accepted that. But like, you can't just, you cannot absolve the sins that, that I have. And I love that idea that we don't really get a redemption arc. We get an acceptance arc. And I love, love, love that so much. And then we come to Heart of Sin, who is played by Aldous Hodge. And he is actually the youngest member of the group. I do believe when we meet um, Heart of Sin, he is 21 years old, <laughs> something like that. He is really young. And yet, for, for anybody who doesn't know, Aldous Hodge is this big, beautiful black man. And he is, Heart of Sin is the hacker. He is the brains. And when you look at Aldous Hodge, it's almost hard to believe because he is built like you would think the bronze of the operation would be. The brawn. But he is the brains. He is sitting there. He is doing the research. He's doing all the hacking. And can we just take a minute and say how awesome it is to see a black hacker. That is awesome. We never get it. We always get the scrawny white guy. Like, no, a black hacker. That's awesome. And, like, again, he is built like he should be the one that is, you know, getting into fights and stuff. The one, the first time we see Hardison get into a fight, he goes after the injured guy because, as he says, shoot, that's my niche. And because he just doesn't fight people. And so, for, and then the other part is, this is also the most emotionally available character on this team. He is arguably the most emotionally mature, although he is only 21. So like he's got a little bit of maturing to do, but he is very much the most emotionally available and he is the big marshmallow. And it could have been so easy to play into so many stereotypes about black man, black men, and they just didn't. And I love that. And then <laughs> Um, and by the way, if you're worry, wondering, they did, I, the, I also love how the writers treated Hardison. They, they never really mentioned him being black unless it made sense to the story. It was just one of those things that were, it really didn't matter until it really did. So for example, he um, ends up getting caught sneaking into an army base and he's freaking out because as he puts it to his, his um, co-conspirators, like, I am a black man who got caught sneaking into an army base. I am going to jail forever. And that's all he says. And w with that line, we immediately understand that the justice system is not kind to black men. And it would be different if you were white. And so I really appreciate how they, they bring it up when it makes sense. But otherwise, it just doesn't matter. I really like that. And then we come to Parker. Parker is a very, very interesting character. She is the other female of this particular team, and she is written in such a way that she is coded as autistic. Now, the writers have stated point blank that that's not what they intended, that they had written a character who is emotionally traumatized from her, you know, backstory and everything. But if you have, if you are autistic, if you have been around people who are autistic, you will recognize the signs. I mean, she is written in such a way that like, I honestly don't know how they can deny it because it's just, com it is very, very consistent with an autistic character. The thing that I really like about that though, is that often when you have these characters who are coded as autistic, they are, um, treated very poorly by the people around them. They're made fun of, they are treated as a burden or as less than, and Parker never is. The team never treats her like a burden. The treat team never treats her like less than. She is not always understood, but they, try, they make an effort to try to understand her. And when she clearly doesn't understand or she, when she very clearly has a lack of knowledge about something, they just teach her. They don't, you know, they don't make her feel inferior. They just said, oh, I have that knowledge, let me teach you. And they accept her for exactly who and what she is. 
And I absolutely love that because we don't get to see that. And honestly, they don't even make her try to change. They give her information and they'll call her out when her behavior endangers other members of the team, but they don't try to make her change when it's not necessary. So I really appreciate that. And uh, I just, I, I can't explain to you how much I appreciate that because it just, we really, really never see that. And so, um, with that, I, I, I love these characters. I love the fact that we could have easily fallen into stereotypes on absolutely everything. I love that the world building is, and the character development is so consistent across the series. And I think that if those are the th kind of things that you look for in books, you might enjoy this TV show as well. But that is all I have, you guys. Um, let me know down below. Have you ever watched Leverage? Are you interested in watching it? I hope you are because it is so, so good. And um, I, that's all I got. So until next time, guys, have happy reading and I will see you in the next video. Bye.